Welcome back to the Foundries Church YouTube channel. We're excited that you chose to connect. If you want to connect throughout the week, please like us on Facebook or subscribe to this channel. With that being said, let's dive into the current series called Short and Sweet. It is good to be with you. We are diving into week four of Short and Sweet, and we're going to look at it um, from a few different angles tonight. The primary angle we're going to use as we look at this is the book of Jude. Now, the book of Jude is a really short book. We're actually going to read the majority of it in, in, our, in our teaching tonight, but as we lean in, the best story that fits with this was the story of Little Red Riding Hood. Jude is a guy who likes his metaphors. Have you ever talked with somebody who, who uses too many metaphors or analogies and all my friends said amen, right? I love me an analogy. I love it as much. No, I won't do it right now. But um, I love an analogy. And um, Jude does a lot of metaphors. He really leans in on it. And what we want to do today is take a minute and build some context. And the best way to do it, unlikely as it may seem, is to lean in to the story of Little Red Riding Hood. Now, many of you may not know this, but the book of the story of Little Red Riding Hood was told by oral tradition for over 700 years in France, and then it was finally written down by Charles Perrault. I'm sure that's not how the French would say it. Don't judge me. I'm sure the T is silent and there's a croissant, but not tonight. Um, but it was written down by Charles Perrault in about 1600. And then it was really grabbed onto by Grimm, the Grimm's brothers, in their fairy tales and grabbed onto around the 1900s and turned into a children's story. The original version by Perrault, was, um, it, was, it had a very significant moral at the end of the story. It said, don't be just afraid of the loud, scary wolves. It's actually the quiet, polite, well-spoken wolves that are the most dangerous. So leave it to the Frenchman to work his way in, right? Well done, Peralt. So we're going to lean into this tonight, and I want you to just kind of join me, because we live in Michigan, and Michigan has that northern French woodsy feel. Fall is in the air, right? You go outside, it kind of smells like wet leaves. It's a great time of year. And um, I want you to join me and imagine this. There's a little girl, and she is bedecked in a red cape with a little hood. And her mom says to her, Little Red Riding Hood, take this basket with wine and some baked goods, because they're French and the sick need baked goods and wine. Take this wine and baked goods to your grandmother's house. She's sick. And as you go, don't stray from the path. And do not talk to strangers. Off the little girl bounds into the dark wooded forest with the bright colored leaves falling down and the wolf spots her and he comes up alongside of her and begins a conversation. She tells him all about how she has a sick grandmother. And so she's taking this wine and cheese to grandmother to make her well. The wolf then realizes that he can eat both grandma and little red. So he says to her, Look at all those beautiful flowers just off the path. And indeed, she looks over and sees that they're really quite pretty. I mean, tell me you're not getting some Garden of Eden imagery here. She sees the fruit, which was beautiful to look at and good for eating. But anyways, we won't do that right now. Um, that's not part of the Little Red Riding Hood narrative. She, she leans off the path. She goes off and begins collecting flowers. And she justifies doing it because it's not a distraction the wolf was right. Grandma's sick and some flowers would make her feel better. The wolf, seeing that he's won some time, books it. I don't know if wolf, yeah, I think a wolf can book it ahead. They run, it runs ahead. It gets there, knocks on the door. Grandma, who is it? It's little Red Riding Hood, you know. Oh, and she opens the door and the wolf eats her. Sorry, you're a child. That's an upsetting moment. But, um, but it, the wolf eats her. The wolf then dons grandma's cap and her night dress and crawls into bed. Little Red Riding Hood, a little bit late with a handful of flowers, knocks on the door. Come in. She goes in. And what do we find? We all know this part of the story. Come close, my dear, so that I can see you. My grandma, what big ears you have. 
right? Kids are the worst. Are you getting bigger? Shh. <laughs> right? My grandma, what big ears you have. My grandma, what big teeth you have. My grandma, what, or what big eyes you have. My grandma, what big teeth you have. And I find it interesting how he draws her ever closer and he says things, the better to hear you with, the better to see you with. And by the time she's up close and says, well, your teeth are kind of sharp, Grandma, the better to eat you with. And he eats Little Red Riding Hood. And we all go, oh, no, that's not how it goes in the little golden books because they can't put this next part in it. The woodsman hears the cry of the little girl and comes running in with his axe and we'll use hunting terms. He field dresses the wolf and pulls Grandma and Little Red Riding Hood out. <laughs> um, we we want to hold on to this narrative tonight. And I want to hold it close to us because it actually really pairs itself up well with Scripture. We're going to talk tonight about the, the book of Jude, the letter of Jude written to the church primarily in, it would have been a very Jewish letter. Uh, Jude is thought to be, he, he's known to be the brother of James, J, the only Jude in scripture who has a brother named James. James's brother is, his half-brother is Jesus. So they believe that Jude was the half-brother of Jesus. I don't know why he chose James over Jesus, but man, if you're going to ever cite somebody, cite Jesus, not James. But anyways, um, so what he does, what we have is this book that is primarily written to a Hebrew Jewish audience. It would have been to the church in uh, like Cappadocia, uh, through the Decapolis up there, down into Jerusalem, where James was the head of the church in Jerusalem. And Jude writes this letter, and he says this, I wanted to talk to you about Jesus. Which I go, okay, but I can't. I can't. I am compelled, he says, to write to you about other things. So he wants to talk about Jesus, but he can't. He's got to actually turn a corner and deal with some things that are going on. And we're going to take some time right now and read through the book of Jude. So join me. If you have your Bibles, open them up, or you can follow along on the screen and read the words as we go. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith. Like in your mind, highlight that. And if you're a Gen Z person, a highlighter is a bright yellow thing that we used on books, which were paper-bound things. But anyways, in your, in your Bible, your app, whatever, highlight it and hold that word, compelled. I felt compelled to write you and to urge you to contend for the faith, to contend, highlight that, hold on to that. That was once and for all entrusted to God's holy people. Because certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality, and they deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Though you, are, though you already know all of this, I want to remind you of something. Now, here's where we get into a distinctly Jewish part of the book of Jude. He's writing to remind them of our history. For you and I, it would be like this. If I was writing you a letter and I'm like, I want to remind you that there was a time in our country where the revolution held in its balance a series of boats that had to get from Brooklyn over to, Brooklyn over to New Jersey. You know, that, that, that famous crossing with Washington. There was a moment, it would be like a, a history class. This is what Jude is doing. You guys already know this, he's saying. But I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt. That's like me saying to you, by the way, Thanksgiving's in November. You'd be like, yeah, we super know. But he's building his case here. But he later destroyed those who didn't believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah 
and the surrounding towns gave them up, themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example to those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. So he's getting really direct now. In the same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies. They reject authority. They heap abuse on celestial beings. And, but even the archangel Michael, so we, we're getting into some angelic understandings here. He's talking about the archangel. We know of Michael, we know of Lucifer, and we know of Gabriel, the archangels. If there's a rank in heaven, these are the three top-ranking angels. Lucifer falls and opposes God and is taken out of heaven. He is removed from heaven. And notice what Jude does. He doesn't even speak badly of Satan himself. He has a respect for some reason for celestial beings. And he uses the archangel Michael when it says, but even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil, Satan, about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn Satan for slander. Now, I I love this. He doesn't, so he's saying not even Michael, not even Michael would say this. These horrible things you're saying about celestial beings. Michael wouldn't even say these things, but he says, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these people, these people who are so much lower than the archangel Michael, they slander what they don't understand. And the very things they do understand, and they understand it by instinct, as irrational animals would understand, it will destroy them. Catch this part. Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have taken the way of Cain. They've rushed into prophet, into Balaam's error, and they've been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. That is three events that take place between Genesis, uh, really I think Genesis 4, all the way up into the later parts of the book of Numbers, where we look at this, or actually it's the book of Deuteronomy, where we look at the people of God In their scriptures, in the Pentateuch, in the first five books of the Bible, they have these stories woven into them. These stories are woven in through the law of God in the first five books of the Bible. The story of Cain and Abel, right? Cain and Abel. Cain, who murders his brother Abel because Abel brought an acceptable sacrifice and Cain's was rejected. Out of bitterness, he hated his brother and he murdered him. Balaam was a non-Israelite prophet who came and was hired by another king to prophesy against Israel and was ended up being killed by the Israelite army. And Korah's rebellion is the story of a people who in the arrogance of Korah, they rose up against Moses and Aaron and Miriam and they said during the Exodus, they exalted themselves and basically said, who are you to think that you can tell us what to do? And what happened was the earth opened up and swallowed them. So, I mean, that kind of made a point for Moses, right? You're like, well, I kind of have the earth opening and eating you. So when he's talking about this, what we understand is he's saying these people in the church that I'm talking about, they're like Cain, they're like Balaam, and they're like Korah, and their destiny is the same. Their destiny is the same. goes on to say these people are blemishes, at your love feast. They eat uh, with you without regard or the slightest qualm. They are shepherds who only feed themselves. They are clouds without rain, blowing, blown along by the wind. They are autumn trees without fruit. They are uprooted and twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. There's a series of metaphors saying, You've got a lot of problems in your future, right? And when you look at this, you can see like he is just unloading on them. Jude is setting up for them an identity that is destined for destruction. He goes on, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. 
These people, they are grumblers, fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves, flatter others for their own advantage. But dear friends, remember, remember, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who follow their own ungodly desires, and these are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, you, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of God and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, authority through Christ Jesus our Lord before all ages, both now and forevermore. Amen. Wow. Jude, right? I told, I was talking with Erica about it today, and I was like, we are doing a series on Jude at some point. Just stay in this for about two months, and I, we will eat like kings from a book like this. This is a good book, but we've got to move through it quickly, and I want to say something as I get ready to go into this next section. A few things are important. Dead trees, wolves, and brute beasts, they're all the same things, Right? They're all the same things. It's one thing called by many different names. So talk to me, let's talk, let me talk with you. Trees without fruit. In verse 12, there is this line that comes up and it says, they're trees without fruit. They are clouds without rain, blown by the autumn wind. Autumn trees without fruit. They are to be uprooted. They are twice dead. Something's going on here. When you talk about a dead, fruitless tree in scripture, your ears should perk up. Your ears should perk up. We know that dead fruitless trees in Scripture or fruitless trees that aren't yet dead are something we should pay attention to because fruit is a term we hear a lot about in church. Like if you're an unchurched person and you come to church and someone says, you know, like, I just want to check the fruit in your life, you're like, what? Have you ever heard that? Like if you've never think about some of the weird things we say in church, you know, I'm not judgmental. I'm a fruit checker. What does that even mean, Bill? That's weird. I don't go here. I came for the Starbucks coffee. Don't be weird and check fruit. Hands off, right? It doesn't even make sense. But we in church understand that fruitfulness is actually something we gather out of Galatians 5.22. Now, the fruits of the Spirit are this. They are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Those are the fruits that grow out of the Christian life, but they don't grow up out of good, healthy, religious practice. They grow out of one thing, being rooted in Jesus Christ. That is the only place they grow. Out of the rootedness in Jesus Christ, out of the roots we put into Christ, that's what translates growth and creates the fruit. That's, what, that's where we get the idea of fruit. The fruits we measure in the Christian community are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. It says we know a tree by its fruit. Jesus says this in Matthew 7, 16 to 20. Jesus uses these words. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Every good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. By their fruit, you will recognize them. By their love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, you will know them. You will know they're Christians by those things growing out of their lives. And you've got to be careful of trees without fruit. Trees that do not have, well, they're twice dead. That's what Jude says. He says these trees are twice dead. And there's something interesting to do with that term. And I like the idea of it because when he's talking about these people, what he's really doing in this is he's saying these are people who once received the grace of, and the peace of Christ into their life. They were once dead in sin, but then coming to the knowledge and grace of Christ, 
They took up involvement in the church and in the ministry, but then maybe subtly, maybe quietly internally, rejecting the call to obedience, they remained and chose to live in their sin and let their sinful nature dominate their lives while pretending to be part of the body of Christ. They're twice dead. They had recognized they were dead and they never came back. So they've died once in their sins, but now having seen and tasted life, they've fallen completely away. So let's look, if there's fruits that grow out of the life of a, of a Christian who is rooted in Christ, there must be signs and symbols of a life rooted, well, of a dead tree, a tree with no roots, a tree that's producing nothing. So here are some traits of dead trees as we see in the book of Jude. First thing is this, there's grumblers. I can't stand these. Anybody else not like grumblers? See, I'm tricking you into grumbling a little. It was awesome. It was like turnabout spare play. It's like, I bet you I can get you to bed. You know, it's one of those tricks. Um, this is what I'm thinking on this. Grumblers are the people who always have to find a reason to complain. The other day, Erica and I went and had breakfast at Morning Star Cafe in Grand Haven. That's a shout out to you guys because your food is amazing. Um, but we were there. We we're having a great time. We get done. I'm paying the lady at the counters on the phone for like a long time. And in a long time in America, I have the memory of a goldfish, probably close to three minutes. It was completely unacceptable, right? And she's talking, and she's taking down an order, and she gets done with it, and she's like, I'm very sorry. But I had been reading the order because I'm nosy, and um, it was for somebody's 60th birthday party. They were getting a cake. I'm like, dude, somebody's turning 60. We should celebrate. You know, invite me. I'll have cake with you. And she just kind of laughed, and we moved on. And we were talking just for a second as I paid, and the woman behind me was just trashing me. I didn't know this. She was a grumbler. She was like, there it is, just some other guy he didn't get what he wants, and now he's up there just laying into that poor girl behind the counter, blah, 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 not knowing that Erica standing next to her was my wife. And she told me when, he got, when we got in the car, I'm like, which one was it? You know, I wanted to go in there and be like, you're a horrible woman. I'm a great person, which probably isn't the most Christian attitude, but I super wanted to set the record straight because they're just sitting there and they're assuming the worst and they're hoping you're a terrible person, right? A grumbler, fault finders. Yeah, we all know them because we are. Um, they celebrate seeing just dysfunction and brokenness. They love to point out. I mean, go to any sports bar tomorrow and watch how many fault finders could never play the position they're critiquing or run even alongside them in the striped uniforms they're critiquing. Fault finders love to point out failure. Boasters. We all know them. They think they're awesome. They're a legend in their own mind. Um, flatterers. Oh, these schmarmy, sleazy people. You know, every time I see you, I just think, I'm so thankful to God for you. And you're like, what did you just say about me? Who are you talking to? You're being way too friendly, right? You know flatterers, they're terrible. Really glad you're here today, and, and you can just feel the schmarminess. Maybe you don't know these people, but there's flatterers, there's scoffers, people who openly mock everything. Nothing is sacred, nothing's okay. They mock everything. Here's the thing we know about the story of Little Red Riding Hood and why I think wolves and dead trees are a good parallel. The wolf... The wolf didn't stop being a wolf. He simply pretended to be something else. He pretended to be something else. He didn't stop being a wolf. He put on the guise of being this good thing, grandmother or Red Riding Hood. He put on the guise of being a friendly person, helping a little girl get flowers on her way, all the while devising a way so he could devour them. Understand, our enemy, our mortal enemy, this Satan himself, our enemy has a desire, much like the wolf, to lead us off the path long enough to get us in a trap that he can spring and devour our life and our purpose. Understand that these people, these traits of dead trees, wolves, whatever you may say, they are grumblers, fault finders, both Boasters, flatterers, and scoffers all for one end, to destroy the life you're living. And we have to see that Jude is putting up with none of it. But we have to be wise as serpents. We have to be wise in this church and know that the wolf doesn't always come up and lay his cards out. He comes up and 
Though his nature isn't changed, his outward appearance was much like the story. And we've got to beware of it. And here's what we know. Dead trees, wolves, brute beasts, they live motivated by instinct, not filled with the Holy Spirit. Not filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is a critical separation between a Christian and someone pretending to be one because someone pretending to be a good Christian person, they'll get enough information, they know enough terms and enough ways to work within the church that they find out what matters to you or what matters to the pastor or to some other person and they use that in in their own advantage to manipulate others to fulfill their own desires. And we have to be cautious as people And we may think like, just go back to me with the the story of Little Red Riding Hood. He listened to her. What's she doing? She gave up all the information. My grandma's sick. I'm just taking her some wine and bread and cheese because we're French and that's medicine. And like taking it off and he's like, okay, great. I bet your grandma loves some flowers. Just kind of leads off the path. Just a little. Just a little bit. And you may think like, okay, that's weird. We don't have wolves talking to us and we don't take wine to our sick grandma. Maybe you do, but that's a little weird. Um, but the reality is, how does it work in our day and age? I know one scam that has worked a number of times over people in my life. It didn't work on my aunt, but I know a number of grandparents who've done this. They get a phone call at a weird hour of day where it's too late to call the other person. It's like 8.30 at night because it's a grandparent, right? And they're long fast asleep, and they call, they're like, hello, and it's like, hey, I am the attorney or the police officer who's holding your grandson or granddaughter, and we need $600 in iTunes gift cards to get them out of jail. No, you laugh. People buy these all the time. We need $600 in Visa gift cards now. Okay, all right, take my number down. If you don't take it down, I'm not calling you back. This is your one chance to get them out of jail. You need $600 in in these gift cards now. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll go, I'll go. Are they okay? They'll be fine. I mean, if you do this, they'll be okay. I'll do it right now. And they run off and do it. They run off and do it. My Aunt Leela, who is a wise woman, oh, man, she's brutal to argue with. She's been on every continent on the earth. She's just tough as nails. And she called me one day. She's like, honey, are you in trouble? I'm like, most likely, but what's up? (laughs) You know, I'm like, I don't know. I mean, what have you heard? You're in California, so I'm sure there's a warrant, you know. And um, and she's like, no, I just got a call that um, something's going on, and they're looking for me to bail you out. And I'm like, well, I don't need bail yet, you know, but... Let me check. And so I checked a couple things. My Aunt Leila, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. She's like, well, I'm sure they won't be calling me back. But if they do, and then she went on like a 20-minute tirade of what she was going to let them know, right? But they scam people, and they lead them subtly astray. They prey on your fears, and they pull you out. And that's what Jude is saying in this. He chastises the, rival, the rivals of the gospel for being arrogant, complainers, People who go against everything, fault finders who flatter people and slowly steer them away. In the Asbury Bible Commentary, it says it this way. The false teachers claim that their experience in grace elevates them above the necessity of moral discipline. So let's just be clear for a minute. What Jude's dealing with is a society that has lost its way with sexual ethics. And he says in the church, Scripture is our rule. And we hold to it. In the foundry church, Scripture is our rule. And we make no apology for saying what Scripture affirms as marriage what Scripture affirms as a healthy sexual ethic, and what Scripture affirms as a godly sexual identity, that's what we affirm. And if culture hates it, which it will, fair enough. Fair enough. Hate away, at least you know where we're at. Hate away if you have to, but the reality is what we're seeing in this is the people who came in lacked sexual restraint. They parade as leaders while lacking the fruit and discipline of a true Christian leader. They're fault finders, manipulators who use the church to their own advantage. What we have to understand as the church in this place is we are now being called to do something. And here's the question. How do we guard our church? How do we guard our church and ourselves? There has to be a protection 
against the wolf. There has to be a protection that keeps us from harm. How do we protect ourselves and the church? And this is what I would say. Contend. Contend. Which means basically this. 1 Corinthians says it's strict training. Colossians 1 says strenuously contend. Colossians 4.12 says it's wrestling. I don't know if you've ever been to wrestling. My oldest son's a wrestler, which makes it very painful when he attacks me now. Because I'm getting older, and I have brittleness taking over, and he's very limber and young. But when he wrestles me, I'm like... I think I'm going to have to bite this time to win. And I'm not above it. I'll pull hair, I'll kick, I'll bite. But I'll tell you what, when you talk about wrestling, it's full engagement. In Timothy, it says, I have fought the good fight. What do these things look like in your life of faith? What does it look like for you to wrestle, to contend, to strictly train? Put these things into your own words. This is how I see it. Strict training, spending time in God's word, serving others, and... What kind of strict training do you need to implement into your life spiritually so that you can be fully alive? Strenuous contend, strenuously contending would be fleeing from temptation, worshiping God in more ways than just church 2.5 times a month, but actually fully engaging your life in it. What about wrestling? What about wrestling and bringing your questions to God and being persistent in prayer? You know, we we have lost the discipline as church to spend time in prayer and be disciplined and focused and know that for some reason the prayers of the righteous avail much and we have to wrestle with God sometimes. The saints of old have been in prayer and there has been war in the heavens and we have to be wrestling on behalf of the will of God in this world in prayer, and then fighting the good fight. Paul said it to Timothy. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. How, what does that sound like in your life? What is the good fight? What is the race that you were called to finish? What does it mean that you would kept, keep the faith? I don't know for you, but I would say, we gotta fight when our faith is tested. When, when it struggles to live and even get its next breath, we have to contend against the enemy of our soul to do what we were made to do, to display the gospel out of the lives we live. So how do we guard ourselves in the church? We contend for the faith. We take an active role in this life that we're called to live. And we also, we keep yourself in God's love. You stay in the love of God. The love of God in Christ Jesus is our one shield and bulwark. It's the thing the enemy can't break and buckle. Our human nature will buckle under temptation most times, but in the love of God, we are found to be fit and unbreakable. Stay in the love of God. Be mindful that his goodness and his mercy comes to you, not because you're a great person, but because he loves you. Be mindful in your own life of the grace of God and your dependence on his goodness to redeem you out of brokenness. Don't forget, be mindful of it. And finally, how do we protect ourselves and our church? We contend, we stay in God's love, And then this is where it gets fun. There's always an offensive end to it, right? We snatch others from destruction. We snatch others from destruction. Has anybody else ever seen the video of um, awesome dad moments where dads like save their kids from weird things and like the kid flies off a swing and dad's like, it's fine. And the kid's like, oh, thanks dad and runs off. Or the dad is like laying and he's clearly like a Southern Baptist because he's wearing a shirt and tie on a Sunday. And he's like laying there and um, he's on the couch. He's kind of edging out and one of the kids rolls off and blind. He's like, catches him and his wife's like, that's so lovely, Todd. You know, like you can just see a moment erupts between them. And it's like this awesome moment, dad moment. Kids getting ready to run and roll. They're like, boom, they saved the child from destruction. I love the idea of Christians as paramedics, as firefighters, as police officers, first responders to the destruction wrought by the enemy, we run up and we grab people and say, yeah, you probably don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. And we grab people and we pull them back from the destruction that is seeking them. Remember the final part of Red Riding Hood? 
the woodsman comes in. What does he do? He liberates the wolf of a grandmother and a girl, right? And what he does is he lays waste to what was trying to destroy them. He cuts them out. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, that's awesome. What if we like, you know, I don't, we don't have to show up in flannel with axes next week. That'd be a little scary, but it'd be awesome, wouldn't it? If we saw ourselves in the role that God intended, that we helped snatch people from destruction and gave no voice to the enemy in our life that said, well, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to hurt any feelings. The reality is this. The book of Jude calls us to stop playing games and having conversations with the enemy of our soul and start living in an active response to the love of God in Christ Jesus. So for you and me today, our challenge and the calling is quite clear. You can't make an excuse for the fact that you are called to get into the ring and fight. You are called to remain in the love of God, your salvation, and there in Christ Jesus. That is the only place that is safe and secure. Remain in the love of God in Christ Jesus. And then get to work snatching people from the pit of destruction. Don't let them go over the edge. Everyone you meet, may you be that weird person they know, like, careful, Eric's going to tell you about Jesus, right? I would love that if that was our reputation here because we took seriously the word of Jude. That snatching people from destruction was the highest calling of every Christian. Pray with me. God, thank you. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the hope that comes in knowing him. And we thank you that you've called us beyond our own grumbling, beyond our own fault finding, beyond, beyond our own boasting, Beyond our own fruitless existence, you've called us to be sons and daughters of the living God, co-heirs to the promises of Christ. So today, Lord Jesus Christ, we, your people, we just open our hands and we say, come, Lord Jesus, have your way in us, and Lord, leave no room in us to allow a conversation with the enemy. No room in us to allow us to get off the path you've called us to walk. God, may we never fall into the enemy's trap, but by the power of your Holy Spirit, may we live as people free, free to pursue you and love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And in so doing, God, we pray that we would love our neighbors as ourselves, and many would be pulled back from the brink of destruction. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. If you would like to prepare for next week's message, please click on the link below to get to our devotions. Now, devotions are an important part of the weekly rhythm at the Foundry Church. We hope that God spoke to you through this message, and we also hope that you join us again next week, because it's going to be great.